Thank you, Seth. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 10 and looking this morning at verses 32 through 45. A little bit of context, if you remember from last week, I think I mentioned the Lord's great Galilean ministry is over. He's now moving south. He's moving from Galilee up to Jerusalem. And we begin with verse 32. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking on ahead of them and they were amazed. And those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, we are able. Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you shall drink and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Hearing this, the ten became, began to feel indignant with James and John. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. History has given us some impressive names. Alexander the Great, Charles the Great, Frederick the Great, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great. Reality is, most of those called great were more like Ivan the Terrible. (laughs) Nevertheless, those uh, flattering names reveal something about us. People admire preeminence. They admire those having the first place. Power and authority are what men consider to be greatness. But Jesus told his disciples, be slave of all. And he was the example. That's the subject of our passage in Mark 10. It is the second lesson the Lord has given on Greatness in as many chapters. Earlier in chapter 9, he taught on it. In verse 35, he told his disciples, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And here, just one chapter later, just a few days later, he gives the same lesson again. Now, that shouldn't surprise us. We... We all need lessons repeated, but uh, that is especially true of this subject. We don't want to be servants. We want to be served. We just can't imagine greatness through service, being exalted by being humble. Greatness is gained by aggression. It's gained by conquest, and so 
it's not surprising that the lesson is given a second time. It was given in the shadow of the cross. In fact, this is a, a well-rounded passage. Jesus begins saying, he will be killed by the Jews and Gentiles, and he ends saying, he will give his life a ransom for many. Really, the cross is the great example of greatness. They were on the road when he gave the, the disciples this lesson. The Passover was near and they were with a group of pilgrims going up to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. He was walking on ahead of them, Mark tells us. And there was something ominous about that. The disciples sensed it. There was evidently a de determination in his stride. It was a fulfillment of Isaiah 50, verse 7. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. In obedience to the law, he was going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, but more importantly, in obedience to his father, he was going to Jerusalem to be the Passover. He knew his father would help him. He knew he would not be put to shame. So he walked on ahead of his disciples, alone, because this was a path only he could travel, a sacrifice that only he could make. And the disciples sensed something different about it. They sensed something solemn about it. They were amazed and fearful, Mark says. He was inflexible in his resolve to go to Jerusalem, to go to the city of destiny. His face was like flint. And they were following like sheep behind their shepherd, though they did not understand that he was going to Jerusalem to lay down his life for them as the good shepherd. So he took them aside, away from the crowd of pilgrims, and he told them what was going to happen to him. Now this is the third prophecy of his crucifixion that he gave in the book of Mark. And each one expands on the revelation. The first time he spoke of his suffering and death and resurrection. The second time he told of his betrayal his death and resurrection. And now this third time he adds that his, uh, his delivery by the Jews to the Gentiles and all of the indignities that he would suffer from them, mocking and scourging. Verse 33, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and, he will, and they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. <coughs> there are seven details that he gives, which shows that he had a clear understanding of what awaited him in Jerusalem. It, it, it would not be a surprise to him this was completely voluntary on our Lord's part. It was completely planned by his father. This was the reason he was born. This was the reason he had come into the world. They would kill him, but three days later, death would be swallowed up in victory. The resurrection was victory over death, but death was victory over sin, and the resurrection confirmed that. The cross was not a defeat. It was a triumph. He crushed Satan there and saved us. The resurrection was the Father's amen to his sacrifice. It was the proof, the historical proof, that God the Father had accepted the work of his Son. And since the Father has done that for us, given His own Son for us, 
well then what won't he do for us? That's the question that Paul asked in Romans chapter 8 and verse 32 and the answer is there's nothing good that he will not do for us. The Lord Jesus Christ is leading us all. He's leading us as he led his disciples here, leading with vision and we should follow him through this world. He may take us through difficult places. He may lead us through valleys that cause fear. But he's always with us. I heard a sermon many years ago by Sinclair Ferguson in which he said, when the journey is hard and our faith is weak and our resolve is slipping, look to Christ, cling to him and say, Savior, help me. And he will. And he does. But Savior help me was not on the minds of the disciples at this time. Just the opposite. They were thinking, Savior honor me. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Jesus didn't agree to grant their request, but he did agree to, to hear it. So they asked, Grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. Earlier in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus told them that in the regeneration, that's what he calls the future age, the kingdom age, the millennium, in the regeneration, he would sit on his glorious throne and the disciples would sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, that was some time earlier when he gave that instruction, but they had not gotten beyond that in their thinking. He's just told them that before the crown there must be a cross, but they're not thinking in terms of the cross that has not registered with them. But this glorious kingdom and these thrones did register, and that's what they were thinking. That had not left their minds, and neither had it left the mind of their mother. According to Matthew, she was the one who brought them to Jesus with the, the question that was asked. She wanted them to sit in these places of glory. She wanted the best for her boys. Now on the positive side, their request was proof of their faith. They believed Jesus was the Messiah. They believed that he would establish the kingdom on the earth that was promised by the great prophets and promised in some detail. They had read those prophecies. They knew those prophecies. And they believed that it would come and that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and the King and the one that would establish it. And that's significant because the nation's leaders, those who should have been the ones that were teaching this, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they did not believe that. So their faith is in, in contrast, stark contrast to the leaders. These, these disciples, their mother, believed in Christ. They believed in, in all that he had taught and who he was. They're, they were firm in their faith. And that needs to be recognized and even praised because their interest was in eternal things. That's good, but it was also an interest in themselves. It was selfish, mainly that. She, the mother, wanted places of honor for her sons. They wanted places of honor for themselves, not for themselves and Peter. Peter was their pal. We see him in a number of different places with the, the other two. Those three were brought into places that others weren't. Not too long before this, it was Peter, James, and John that were on the Mount of Transfiguration. And those three were given this glorious vision of Christ the King in His glory and given a hint of the glory of the kingdom to come. But here, they're secretly cutting out Peter and the others. This was about getting first place. 
Jesus could see that, and he could see that this was another opportunity to give the disciples a lesson on service, on being slaves. But before that, he asked James and John if they really understood what they were asking, because they were asking for more than they or their mother knew. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? The cup and baptism were symbols of suffering. Uh, with one, suffering enters a person like wine drunk from a cup. With the other, a person enters suffering as one enters water when baptized. The, the suffering the Lord would experience was complete. It was both within and without. It was both physical and spiritual. It would be from others against him, and it would be in his own soul. The, the cup of God's wrath would be poured out at the cross, and he would drink all of it. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane preparing for the cross, he prayed that the cup would pass from him if that were possible, that he would avoid it if that were possible. But James and John naively answered, we are able. So he answered them. They would drink it. They would be baptized into suffering, and they were. We know that from their history. James was killed in Jerusalem. He's the first apostle martyred, Acts chapter 12. And John was baptized, or rather was banished uh, to the Isle of Patmos. Now that was the life of an apostle. It wasn't a glorious life. It was a life of trial and suffering. So they would be. They would enter into that suffering. But he added in verse 40, to sit on my right or on my left, this is not mine to give but it is for those for whom it has been prepared, already been prepared, which indicates the sovereign hand of God in all of this. His plan and purpose has already arranged the order of priority. So that rests with the Father. Well, if James and John intended this to be a private interview, it wasn't. The other disciples heard it and were not happy with what they heard, not at all happy with the discussion, and they became indignant toward the brothers. They were just as ambitious as James and John, and now they were jealous. It is the very thing that the Lord had rebuked earlier in chapter 9 when he told them that if they want to be first, they must become last. And here it goes again. They hadn't learned. So Mark writes in verse 42 that, that the Lord called them together and he gave them an, another lesson on self-denial and the way to true greatness. They were behaving like pagans. And he reminded of that. He, he reminded them of the rulers of the Gentiles and what they do, how they lord it over their subjects. And the great men of the world exercise authority, and they exercise authority with an iron fist. There are many, many examples of that from the Pharaohs to the Caesars. And just a few years after Paul was executed, the apostles' judge, Nero, committed suicide, and that set off a bloody scramble for the throne. It was the year 69. The first to the crown, to the, rather the first to crown himself Caesar was Galba, who said, now I am emperor and I can do whatever I like and do it to anyone. He lasted seven months when the next guy did to him what he wanted and he lasted five days before he was assassinated by the next emperor who was also assassinated, and all that within the year A.D. 69. That's selfish ambition. That's the way of the Gentiles. It's deadly. And it's not only ancient history, it's what happens. 
in, in, in a more civilized way in the corporate world or the academy or in the home. Bosses intimidate employees. Husbands and wives try to gain the upper hand. And what's the result? Disharmony, unhappiness. And, and, and that was characteristic of the 12. They were divided against themselves. They're all subject to this, just as we are all subject to this, this very problem. So in the next verses, verses 43 and 44, the Lord corrects them. But it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. What all 12 wanted was greatness. They wanted to be known as James the Great and John the Great. But they saw greatness through the eyes of the Gentiles. And they were actually the terrible. Greatness among the Lord's disciples. Greatness for the Christian is based on service. And the Lord uses two words to make that point. Diakonos and doulos. The word diakonos, deacon, is a combination of two words. The Greek word dia, a preposition, which means through. And the word konos, the Greek word for dust. Literally, that word means through dust. And it gives the picture of a person working hard, stirring up the dust as, as he or she moves about, toiling away and serving people. It's, it's not a term of nobility, at least not a term of nobility with the world. But if the first word, service, servant, isn't enough to convey the Lord's meaning. He adds another word to it, a really a stronger word, doulos. Very common word in the New Testament. It's the word slave, sometimes translated, at least in the New American Standard Bible, as bondservant. It tones it down a bit, but it's the word slave. The Gentiles want to make everyone their slaves. The Lord said, be a slave to everyone. Slaves are people without rights. They are the lowest people. And the Lord was saying, that is the attitude and the way to lead, that leads to true greatness. It's service. But there's nothing more counterintuitive than that, is there? Because it's all about denying yourself. And that's difficult. That's not natural. Not natural for the natural man. In fact, in our Lord's day, among the pagans, humility was not regarded as a virtue. It was regarded as a vice. Who wants to get down in the dust? Where's your dignity? That's how the pagans looked at it. That's how the Gentiles looked at this. But that's what the Lord was saying we must do. We are to live for others, not for ourselves, not seek our own rights, but their blessing. What that really means is we are to love others above self. But again, that's easier said than done. Anyway, anyone can, uh, can say, make sacrifices. Anyone can say, be a servant. I can say it. I can say it very easily. It's quite another thing, isn't it, to actually do what one says. But the Lord did. He not only taught by word, he taught by example. He was the model of this very thing. And that's what he says next in our last verse, verse 45. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. William Hendrickson, a good commentator, called this, one of the most precious of Christ's statements. It's on a par with John 3.16. But the Lord is not simply making a, a statement about 
who he was and what he would do. He is making a statement to show that he is the example of the very thing that he is urging them to do. He's the ultimate example. He was telling his disciples to be servants as he was a servant. And there's no greater example of service and sacrifice than our Lord. The, the Son of Man came to serve, not be served. The title Son of Man highlights the, the magnitude of his sacrifice. It's the Lord's favorite expression or title of himself in the synoptic gospels in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we've seen it many times. Uh, it's a messianic title. It's taken from Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. And in a night vision, Daniel the prophet saw the Son of Man on the clouds coming to the Ancient of Days to receive a kingdom. The Son of Man is a heavenly person. That is his origin, heaven itself. And he's a king. He is the king of kings. He is a divine person. Jesus suggests that not only in the, the name, the title, Son of Man, and all that we learn of that and see of that in the passage in Daniel, but we see it here in the statement that he made and the way he, he states his point. He said he did not come to be served, but to serve. Now, we don't talk like that normally, do we? We, don't, we say, I was born. We don't say, I came or I have come. It, but the Lord did. That's one of his favorite expressions of, 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 of his entrance into this world. And it indicates that he existed before he came. The Son of Man is the Son of God, the eternal Word, as John put it, the creator and the sustainer of all things. And he came on a mission. He came to be a servant of all things. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7 that he emptied himself. He set aside his divine prerogatives and took the form of a bondservant. How did he empty himself? By becoming a servant. Actually a doulos, a slave. He voluntarily, willingly left the highest position to take the lowest spot. And he did it for us. He did that so that he could serve us and serve us by giving himself up as a ransom for many. This word ransom is prominent in the New Testament and was a common word in that day. It was commonly used of the price that was paid for freeing a slave or freeing a captive. The disciples would have been very familiar with this word. What is uh, unusual here is that the ransom paid, the ransom price was not silver, but Christ. He came to give his life a ransom for many, to be a substitute. And that's what he did. His life was given in exchange for ours. He suffered the penalty of our sin in our place on the cross so that we might escape that judgment and go free. Now that's the way Peter explained it in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, we, you, were redeemed, ransomed with perishable things, not with perishable, not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life. But, as Peter says, with the precious blood of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. The sinless life of Christ was uh, offered up as a blood sacrifice for his people. <clears throat> the word many refers to a specific people, his people, his elect. It's what the angel told Joseph in Matthew 1, verse 21, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And that's what he did. 
through his sacrifice. He saved his people, the elect. Now that's indicated by the word he used here to describe his death. It was a ransom. And again, a ransom is a payment made to free a slave or captive. When the exchange was made, when the ransom was paid, the release was secured, and the captive went free. It didn't make freedom possible. It actually secured it. It accomplished it. When the, the payment was received, freedom was a fait accompli. And at the cross, Christ secured the release of his people. His death wasn't universal, meaning he didn't die to save everyone without exception. If he had, all would be saved. All would go free. Christ could not have died for all without exception, paid their ransom, and God not have set them free. That all are not saved proves that he did not die for all, but died particularly, specifically for his people. Now that's not a position that you will hear taken in most pulpits probably, or in most seminary lecture halls, but it's a position that's taken by some very important and significant people taken because I believe it's absolutely correct. Charles Spurgeon was one who held that position, and I think he explained it very well when he said, if Christ <clears throat> has died for you, you can never be lost. God will not punish twice for one thing. If God punished Christ for your sins, he will not punish you. Payment God's justice cannot twice demand, first at the bleeding Savior's hand, and then again at mine. How can God be just if he punished Christ, the substitute, and then man himself afterwards? And that's true. If Christ died for all and multitudes perish, they're being punished twice once in the substitute, and once on their own. God can't accept the ransom and then punish the ransomed. In Peru, there is a, a building called the Ransom Room. <clears throat> it was where the Spanish conquistador Francisco Pizarro imprisoned the emperor of the Incas after he conquered the Inca Empire. And when the Inca saw the Spaniards' lust for gold, he offered to fill the large room where he was being held, fill it once with gold and twice with silver, if they would release him. Well, the Spaniards agreed. And so the Inca's people scattered out throughout the empire and they gathered up gold and they gathered up silver and they delivered the ransom payment, all of that precious metal, filled the room with gold, then filled it twice with silver. And then Pizarro staged a mock trial, condemned the Inca to death and executed him. It was a gross injustice. Christ could not pay the ransom in full for anyone, and his father, the judge of all the earth, not honor it. Justice demands that those for whom the price was paid be freed. Now, someone will object. Well, but a person must believe. People perish because of unbelief. Well, of course. Unbelief is, is the, the basis of every sin. Every sin that's committed is really an act of unbelief. And Christ died for all our sins, unbelief included. He said it is finished. There's nothing left to do. But Christ not only paid for all the sins of all for whom he died, he also gained righteousness for us, which is the opposite of sin, which includes faith, which is the opposite of unbelief, 
And as a result, in each generation, the Holy Spirit applies the benefits of Christ's sacrifice to those for whom he died, and that includes the gift of faith. It's all of the Lord. He deserves all the glory. That should be the result of his sacrifice for us. It should cause us to praise God for his mercy and grace. He saved us. He saved us. And it should encourage us with assurance. We cannot be lost if we're his. If he bought us, he can't lose us. Now, that assurance is reinforced by the fact that his atonement was personal. It, it was not some general act in which he provided salvation for all but secured it for none. It was effective. It was personal. In Augustus Toplady's hymn, Rock of Ages, there's the line, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. A, a place in Christ, in the rock, was cleft specifically for you. He thought of you on the cross. It was intensely personal. His love for you, if you are a believer, is direct and personal. And his ministry on the cross is so thorough, so complete. Not so complete, it is complete. That it could not fail. That's Isaiah 50 verse 7. I know that I shall not be put to shame. And the Father did not put him to shame. The Father honored everything he did, approved of it, raised him from the dead to demonstrate that he had accepted the payment that was made for all for whom he died. And we, therefore, cannot be lost. Now, when we say Christ died for the elect, we don't mean that he died for just a little group of people the elect few. There are many, that's how he describes it, many. Not everyone, but multitudes. Those the Father chose from all eternity are numbered like the stars of the heaven, like the sand of the seashore, like the dust of the earth. How do you count all of that up? An innumerable multitude. But, but what is truly amazing in this statement about the many it's not the number, it's not the, the quantity, it's the quality. It's the kind of people for whom he sacrificed his perfect life. He died for Gentiles. He died for pagans as well as for Jews, as well as, as, well as for Israelites. He, he died for sinners. He died for the unworthy. That's who Christ saves. And that is greatness. Though he is equal with the Father, he became a man, and not just a man, but a servant, a slave, to suffer death on the cross for us. Shouldn't we then be willing to sacrifice for him? Shouldn't we be willing, as he instructs us here, to sacrifice for one another, to, to humble ourselves and put others ahead of ourselves, to be slaves of all? And of course the answer to that is yes. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. That's the greatest service and act of love there is. But if we should do the greater, we should do the lesser. In fact, I wonder if perhaps it's not in a sense easier to do the hardest thing than to daily do the lesser things. Shouldn't we seek to bless others and actually do it? Of course we should. How do we do that? Well, by doing what is right from, from the most simple to the most sublime. From helping with, uh, with the dishes after dinner or whatever makes life easier for our spouse, to, to giving time and energy to the church in service of the gospel. I, that's just, just a few examples. You think about it. How can you serve one another? I think what the Lord is speaking of here is 
It was put very well by Dr. Bruce Walke, who spoke of disadvantaging self to advantage others. Can we do that? That's what he's speaking of here. Now that, can we do that? That's the question, because this is very difficult to do, isn't it? Very difficult to be a slave voluntarily. <clears throat> I say it's difficult, it's impossible, apart from grace. But if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then you are a believer because you have received grace, you have received abundant grace, you have received an infinite amount of grace. And so we can do that because we have been ransomed, bought from, and brought out of what Peter called a futile way of life. We have been saved from a selfish life that is lived for things that are disappearing. And we have been given a life of everlasting rewards and blessing. We are a new creation in Christ and we have new abilities that we did not have before. We have the grace of God at work in us. We are alive and we're to act upon that. And we can by the power of the Holy Spirit as we walk by the Spirit. Now that's the sovereign grace of God. It saves us. It changes us. And it equips us so that we can live lives of lasting value and bless others and bring glory to God. That's what Christ tells us. That is real greatness. Well, maybe we have an unbeliever here who thinks that um, all this talk of Christ's death and forgiveness doesn't really include him or her. Uh, I'm not sure I'm one of the elect. I have my doubts about that. Well, you don't know that. Jesus said that the number was many, many. Assume you're in that many. Believe. Believe in Christ. He said in John 6 that he receives all who come to him. So trust in him. He will receive you if you do that. And if you do that, well, that's the proof that you are one of the elect. So may God help you to see that and to come to him. And you who have, rest in him. You're secure in him. You have life in yourself. Live it. And live it as he directs us to do that here. We can by his grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the words of your son. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son. He came for this purpose, to give his life a ransom for many. And we thank you that he saved us. We who have believed in him have believed in him because he purchased us and purchased our faith and by the Spirit of God has brought that to us. We thank you for all that we have in Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.